Hi everyone, my name is Kelly Murphy and I'm Chief Operating Officer at the Museum of the American Railroad. I've been with the museum for over 15 years now and I've really enjoyed my time there. I started my work in public history after graduating with a degree in history from Clemson University. So it's been a great ride and I've never looked back. So I'm very excited to be a part of our ongoing virtual tour series as we all continue to shelter in place. Our first video did get a lot of good feedback. It was on ballast. So who knew rocks were so important to the operation of trains and to the economy? So uh, I'm very excited to be introducing our second in our series. Uh, it focuses on some cars that are rather utilitarian, but if you dig a little bit deeper, you'll realize that these cars have great stories to tell. And we hope we do a good job of telling those stories today. So here we go. We would like to introduce our video on the museum's 10 Metra Highliner commuter cars. What is 850 feet long, weighs 1.4 million pounds, and carries 1,560 passengers on two levels? No, it isn't the big boy steam locomotive. It's a 10 car commuter train recently relocated from Chicago to Frisco. If you visited the Museum of the American Railroad or driven by our location, you've no doubt seen a long train of tall blue and silver passenger cars. For this segment, I'd like to talk about these cars, their historical significance, and the technology behind them. They are full-size rail cars, but they weren't used in intercity service Rather, they were used on a commuter line in Chicago that served the South Suburbs. Their story is the story of millions of people's lives as they came and went in the Windy City for over 40 years. They are known as bi-level EMU cars, or electric multiple unit, with each car having its own set of motors at the wheels and gathering power from overhead wires known as catenary. And while they appear rather utilitarian, close inspection reveals several advancements in design and technology for the time. We acquired 10 of the cars in 2016 from Chicago's Metropolitan Rail, more commonly known as Metra. But what is the significance of a commuter rail car from Chicago at a museum in Texas? And why so many? To answer these questions, some history is in order, which includes the fascinating past of Metra's electric division and the adaptability of these cars for use in a museum environment following retirement. These EMUs were originally built in 1971 for the Illinois Central Railroad. They operated on IC's electrified line between Chicago's Loop and South Suburban communities such as Calumet, Homewood, University Park, and Blue Island. When first inaugurated, the cars were given the name Highliners, a name arrived at through a competition in Chicago schools along the line. Chicagoans referred to them as Highliners throughout their entire career and the name became part of the city's vocabulary. A total of 166 Highliners were constructed through two orders, placed in 1971 and 1979. The first order was completed by the St. Louis Car Company of St. Louis, Missouri, and the second by Bombardier of Montreal. Both orders were built to essentially the same specifications, the museum has examples of both in its collection. But to truly appreciate these cars, you have to look at the long history of the Metra Electric Division and the events leading up to their construction. The Highliners and the cars that came before them were truly built out of necessity. Their use here at the museum will to some extent be out of necessity as well. As you will see, their seating and configuration is perfect for an immersion experience classroom.
Let's trace the history of the cars, which ultimately goes back to the origins of the Illinois Central Railroad, also known as the IC for short. The line ran primarily from Chicago and the Midwest to the Gulf Coast. In later years, the IC became known as the Main Line of Mid-America, tapping Centralia, Memphis, Jackson, and New Orleans on its way to the Gulf. But its early presence was between Chicago and downstate Illinois. Owned by railroad tycoon E. H. Harriman, it was the longest line in the United States by 1856. The IC was the first railroad built with land grants, and for a time, Abraham Lincoln served as its lawyer. The northern terminus of the Illinois Central Railroad was conveniently situated on Chicago's busy lakefront, serving the heart of the city. By 1870, the railroad was an integral part of the bustling city, but the Illinois Central would soon take on another very important role. On October 8, 1871, the Great Chicago Fire, lasting three days, devastated the city. Over 17,000 structures were destroyed, along with an estimated 300 fatalities. The fire changed everything about Chicago, where people lived, worked, and traveled, including the emergence of suburbs. With most of their homes and businesses destroyed, Chicagoans moved south and created new communities in which to live. Many of those communities were located along Illinois Central's line. However, with the shortage of workers available to reconstruct the city, they traveled back into Chicago to rebuild. Filling an important transportation need and seeing an opportunity for commerce, the Illinois Central started operating more trains between the city and the new suburban communities. Workers traveling to and from the city had fast, reliable, and convenient transportation to their jobs in Chicago. Thus, the IC's commuter operations became a significant and permanent lifeline for thousands of daily riders. As the city rebuilt, the suburbs continued to grow and prosper, with the line becoming an important feeder. As demand increased, more trains, additional stations, and route extensions followed. Back in Chicago, another transformation was taking place as the city recovered from the fire. Debris was used as fill along the lakefront to extend the city's footprint beyond the original shore of Lake Michigan. This fill allowed for new outdoor public space, including the creation of Grant Park, land which was adjacent to large parcels of property owned by the Illinois Central Railroad. The line found itself further embedded in a city on the mend. IC operations and facilities were major fixtures along the south shore of Chicago, including the line's magnificent central station, constructed in time for the opening of the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. The station served IC's intercity trains bound for Midwest destinations and its flagship service to Memphis and New Orleans. The station complex included a separate building housing general offices for the Illinois Central Railroad. A large neon sign bearing the line's logo was constructed in later years, which became a fixture in Chicago's skyline along the lakefront. A more modest commuter station already existed a few blocks north on Randolph Street, the terminus of the IC line in Chicago. The station was upgraded over the years with longer platforms and overhead access to tracks. 
A newer version of Randolph Street Station stands today as one of the busiest commuter terminals in the U.S. Renamed Millennium Station, it became an underground facility when Millennium Park was constructed above the IC's electric district yard. Sadly, Central Station was demolished in 1974. It bears mentioning at this point that Chicago was essentially starting over when new construction began following the fire. By the early 1880s, new materials were introduced in building construction, such as stone, concrete, and later steel. The result was the emergence of a style of architecture known as the Chicago School. Still regarded today as one of the most significant architectural styles, it is credited with giving birth to the skyscraper. As the city continued to grow and prosper, more railroads built into Chicago. Along with these lines came additional stations and commuter routes radiating north and west. In 1926, Illinois Central's steam-powered suburban trains to the south gave way to new electrified cars. That year, the IC Electric, as it became known, was Chicago's busiest suburban railroad, carrying 26 million passengers. Some railroads found favor with electrification in the 1920s particularly on high-density routes. The initial investment of electrification was high, but operating costs were considerably lower than steam-powered trains. In the Illinois Central's case, it made sense to transition from steam to electricity with so many frequencies along the commuter line south of Chicago. Electricity was gathered by pantographs from overhead wires known as catenary. The catenary is strung over the tracks a few feet above the top of the train by a series of suspension bridges. Pantographs are simply an articulated metal framework that makes contact with the wires through spring tension and delivers electricity to motors at the wheels. This system is still used by Metro Electric today and is also found on DART light rail trains in Dallas and surrounding communities. Illinois Central's new electric cars of the 1920s were known as motor trailers, with one car powered and the other semi-permanently coupled car non-powered. They operated on 1500 volts DC provided from overhead wires. The new electrified cars were constructed entirely of steel. A total of 140 paired sets were constructed. They were manufactured by the Pullman Company, whose plant was located at 111th Street along IC's main line. These cars proved highly successful and incredibly durable. They remained in service for nearly 50 years. Lacking air conditioning and other amenities, Chicagoans accepted them as a way of life as they came and went about their daily commutes. It seemed as though they would operate forever and simply be adopted by future generations. By the late 1960s, increasing ridership and a desire for more comfort were placing demands on the old fleet and its loyal riders. It was apparent that the 1920s era commuter cars would have to be phased out in favor of newer, more modern equipment. The need for new cars came at a time when the railroads were reluctant to invest in their passenger operations. Intercity trains were being discontinued at a rapid pace and suburban lines were operating on slim margins or at a loss. Illinois Central was already rebranding itself and diversifying into new lines of business unrelated to rail. 
If new cars were to be built for the electric division, government assistance was needed to offset the capital costs that were seen as a burden to the carrier's bottom line. Through one of the first programs in the country, the Illinois Central was able to secure federal assistance for the design and purchase of new suburban cars. The program was enabled through the creation of the South Suburban Mass Transit District, which provided for public administration and ownership of the new cars. Concept designs and specifications were prepared, calling for bi-level cars offering the latest in passenger comfort. The new Highliners were functionally yet handsomely styled, having a postmodern, forward-looking appearance. The industrial design firm Sunberg Farrar of Dearborn, Michigan is credited with the style. Each car would have 156 seats, with 92 on the lower level and 64 seats in the upper gallery. This effectively increased the capacity of the trains with a minimal investment in equipment and crews. More importantly, suburban commuters would enjoy air conditioning in the new cars. Bids were solicited from the major car builders of that period, with the St. Louis Car Company receiving the nod for construction. As the low bidder, the company manufactured the cars using core 10 and low alloy steel versus more expensive stainless steel, which was the industry standard. A number of features were held over from the original suburban cars of the 1920s, including motorman controls and mechanical systems. This was done to reduce costs and ensure classification of the new cars as transit vehicles. As with the old cars, this classification allowed for reduced crew requirements, resulting in lower operating costs. Transit-style couplers, also known as Tomlinson couplers, were used, which have air and communication connections integrated in the design. Solid-state electronics for control systems debuted on the new cars, one of the first uses of this technology in a commuter railroad environment. In early 1971, the first Highliners arrived on the Illinois Central for testing. Operating crews were trained on the new cars, which varied considerably from the handling of the older motor trailer sets. Air over hydraulic brakes were a new feature, which had different operating characteristics. Ironically, introduction of the Highliners coincided with the discontinuance of several Illinois Central intercity passenger trains. The creation of Amtrak in May of 1971 saw discontinuance of many remaining routes operated by private railroads across the U.S. As a result, the IC's famous Panama Limited made its last run between Chicago and New Orleans. The majestic Central Station became obsolete when Amtrak operations were consolidated into Union Station. Central Station closed its doors forever less than a year later. But IC's suburban operations were far from declining. On May 17, 1971, the first inaugural run of the Highliners took place with dignitaries and railroad officials on board. President Nixon sent a congratulatory message to Illinois Central's President Alan Boyd who would later go on to be president of Amtrak. The inaugural run followed the route of the IC's original commuter train of 1856. One by one, the tall and imposing Highliners with sealed tinted windows began to replace the older Pullman Green cars with open sashes that once occupied acres of the Chicago waterfront. The new cars were the pride of the Illinois Central and the communities they served. 
They ushered in a new era of suburban commuter service and showed promise for the future of passenger rail. A total of 136 cars were produced in the initial order at a cost of $40 million, $26 million of which was funded through the federal grant. The Highliners had a rather striking exterior, finished in muted silver with black window belts separated by Illinois Central's signature Panama orange accent. The fronts of the cars were originally finished in black, a feature that would contribute to operational safety concerns early on. Entry to the cars was through double doors located in a center vestibule. Passengers could then go through another set of doors to either end of the cars. This made for fast unloading and loading of passengers at stations. Entry doors had smart strips that reopened them and prevented the train from moving if a rider was boarding or detraining as they were closing. Further, there were no steps to encounter as the entry vestibules were situated at platform height. This resulted in faster commuter schedules and shorter station dwell times, not to mention increased safety particularly during inclement weather. The cars were 85 feet in length and weighed in at 140,000 pounds, 34% lighter than the old paired cars, but seating the same number of passengers. Top speed of the cars was 75 miles per hour. Another interesting feature was a somewhat wider car body as compared to the previous Pullman-built cars. When viewed from the ends, the Highliners displayed a slightly pushed-out appearance at the window belt. This allowed for greater width in the seating area while maintaining original width at the lower side seals to accommodate existing platforms along the line. Interiors resembled earlier gallery cars elsewhere on commuter routes in Chicago, having seating along a second level on each side of the car, in addition to traditional lower level seating. This design was very successful on Bud and Pullman built gallery cars in the 1950s. Seating in the new cars was in stark contrast to the old Pullman-built heavyweight cars, which had wicker seats throughout. Colors and materials were typical of the 1970s, with seats upholstered in, you guessed it, bright orange and harvest gold vinyl. This, combined with generous light from windows at both levels, created an open and airy feeling inside the cars. A few other details about the cars include their ownership, which was officially with the South Suburban Mass Transit District, the public agency created to channel federal dollars to the Illinois Central. Each car was constructed at a cost of $307,000. Unlike their predecessors, they could run individually rather than in pairs. However, Highliners usually ran two cars back to back, and as many as six cars during rush hours. The Highliners were not without a few problems during the first months of operation. The sophisticated electro-pneumatic hydraulic braking system resulted in slower applications, which required crews to adapt accordingly once weaned off the older cars. Some additional modifications were made to the earliest cars already delivered, while production changes were made to new builds. The Highliners proved very successful and well accepted by commuters between Randolph Street Station and South Suburbs. Trains ran like clockwork through and to these communities, providing passenger comfort and reliability through the hottest of summers and severest of winters.
The saddest day in the life of the fleet was undoubtedly early on in its career. On October 30, 1972, during the morning rush hour, an inbound Highliner train was backing up to the 27th Street station after overrunning the platform, when it was struck from behind by an express train. The express, made up of the older Pullman heavyweight cars, telescoped into the rear Highliner, causing multiple fatalities, one of the worst accidents in U.S. history. A series of incidents led to the accident, including failure of the Highliner train to make a flag stop at 27th Street, resulting in the engineer stopping beyond the station platform and reversing the train. Unfamiliarity with a new braking system was likely a factor in overrunning the platform. The decision to back the train proved fatal, as it had already cleared a signal block allowing the express to proceed behind it. Further, the train crew aboard the Highliners was unable to see several yards behind the train to protect the backup move due to a poor line of sight from the center vestibules. The older Pullman-built cars on the express collided with the Highliners at a closing speed of approximately 45 to 55 miles per hour, ultimately killing 45 people and injuring 332, most of whom occupied the Highliner cars. Both trains were standing room only during the 7.15 a.m. collision. The telescoping action of the older heavyweight car into the Highliner was largely a result of the differences in design and construction of the two cars. The lead car of the heavyweight train lifted up off its trucks upon impact contributing to the penetration of the rear Highliner, resulting in a greater loss of lives. The black painted ends of the Highliners were refinished in orange as a result of the accident, because the dark color was thought to have contributed to the express train engineer's inability to see the train ahead. In later years, reflective safety striping was added to the ends of the cars for further visibility when the new MetroPaint scheme was applied. An NTSB report recommended new operating rules for the Illinois Central crews and collision protection modification for the remainder of the Highliners under construction, including reinforcing plates and additional welds to the car bodies. While somewhat tarnished from the accident, the Highliners went on to have an exemplary record of safe operation for the next 44 years. Trains on the IC Electric came and went like clockwork. In this rare footage taken by Dan Morris in the mid-1970s, an inbound train departs 12th Street Station. 12th Street was a bustling station, especially during rush hour, serving South Michigan Avenue and several lakefront attractions, including the Museum District and Grant Park. From here, inbound trains negotiated a labyrinth of tracks and switches as they approached the final two stops in Chicago. In another rare clip by Morris, a southbound train departs Van Buren Station for the south suburbs. Van Buren is just one stop short of the line's terminus at Randolph Street Station in downtown Chicago. Van Buren was convenient to many riders coming and going from corporate offices along South Michigan Avenue and provided access to elevated trains in the downtown loop. As the footage shows, Overhead walkways eliminated crossing busy tracks, a design that was incorporated early on in the construction of stations. During the 1970s, Illinois Central, along with other railroads providing commuter service to Chicago, began receiving subsidies from a newly formed Regional Transportation Authority to offset losses incurred by suburban trains. 
This was reflected in a modified paint scheme with RTA lettering that was applied to highliners during shoppings. In 1979, Illinois Central placed a second order for additional highliners. However, St. Louis Car Company had ceased operation in 1974. The 30 additional cars were produced by Canadian car builder Bombardier. In 1984, Chicago's RTA was reorganized and renamed METRA, which eventually assumed operation of all of Chicago's commuter railroads. Today, a total of 11 routes serve 242 stations, with over 80 million boardings annually. All but the electric division were served by diesel-hauled push-pull trains. In 1987, Metra formally purchased the Illinois Central's electric operations, assuming full responsibility for the line. With responsibility for operation and ownership now under METRA, route enhancements and reinvestment in equipment was planned for the electric division. The number of stations increased to 49. In 1993, the Highliner fleet saw major improvements, including a remanufacturing program for all 166 cars and a bright new exterior paint scheme. Remanufacturing ensured the fleet's survival well into the 2000s. The cars also debuted a totally new paint scheme, sporting broad blue striping and Metra's stylized logo. The cars carried this scheme to the end of their service. The Highliner fleet soldiered on through the years enduring social, cultural, and economic changes in Chicago life. City dwellers and suburbanites lived, worked, and played by the punctual comings and goings of the trains. The Highliners gained a reputation of reliability and were oftentimes refuge from the summer heat and bitter cold winters for riders while in transit. Winters were often grueling on suburban operations, testing the metal of human and machine. From operating departments to maintenance forces, the Midwestern snowstorms were a formidable challenge to keeping the lines open, at a time when reliance on public transportation was at its greatest. Travel between Millennium Station in the downtown Loop and the south suburbs offered a variety of urban vistas that slowly transitioned to more open spaces. At an average speed of 65 miles per hour, a trip to University Park, the furthest endpoint from downtown, took an hour and 10 minutes. The one-way fare was $6.25. Perhaps the most picturesque view was from the engineer's compartment, providing an unobstructed view ahead of the train. Controls were simple, yet functional, and were based on the motorman controls more commonly found in transit vehicles. This was a holdover from the original Pullman heavyweight cars of the 1920s. Elsewhere on the Metra system, trains are powered by diesel-electric locomotives. Let's ride along with Metra conductor Don Kaisgen on one of the West Suburban routes pulled by locomotives. On these trains, Cars are constructed entirely of stainless steel, also having bi-level seating. Trains operate in a push-pull fashion, with the locomotive pulling the trains outbound and pushing them inbound to Chicago. This design evolved from Burlington and Rock Island, two of Metra's predecessor lines. Built by the Bud Company in the early 1950s, they're similar to cars of the same era used on the Chicago and Northwestern. The design was refined over five decades to become standard in new car construction. Here's a brief interview with Don aboard one of the stainless steel trains with a little insight into his job. I've been with Metro for 21 years, but I've been in train service for almost 19 years. 
So I, I just remember starting 19 years ago, you know, you, you start meeting people on the train that you hear about the little kids and then all of a sudden 19 years later, those little kids are now going into college. So, I mean, I think just, it's enjoyable to go to work. I think a lot of people get up in the morning and they're like, ugh, I gotta work today. You know, I gotta go to that office and sit back behind that desk. For me, I enjoy getting up in the morning. Not like I'm jumping out of bed going to work, but I enjoy getting up and going to work and working with the guys I work with. Metro commuters, your attention please. The next Metro train approaching your station will be a Metro train. The diesel powered trains would influence new equipment on the electric division. With Highliners nearing their fourth decade of service, Metro was planning for their eventual retirement. Their uniqueness was leading to increased maintenance costs and scarcity of replacement parts. The decision was made to base the Highliner replacements on the standard car body design elsewhere on Metro. The only difference being electric propulsion and a notched out area on the roof to accommodate a pantograph. In 2005, Metra took delivery of the first Highliner replacements. Dubbed Highliner 2s, the stainless steel cars were built by Sumitomo Nippon Sharyo. They were to be phased in over a period of years as funding became available for their purchase. They ran alongside the old Highliners for nearly 10 years. Gradually, the Highliner 2s began to outnumber their predecessors as subsequent orders were delivered. The once common silver and blue cars gave way to stainless steel and it became more and more infrequent to see trains of the original equipment. Retired Highliners were made available for sale through public offerings, presumably as scrap. The first offering of surplus cars took place even as a few survivors remained in service. Enter the Museum of the American Railroad. We learned of the availability of Metra surplus Highliners through a public offering. The timing was right, as we were looking for examples of suburban commuter cars to tell the story of the railroad's role in urban America. Further, the museum was in need of classroom space as an interim measure until a permanent building could be constructed. What better way to present the subject than to immerse students in an authentic setting while delivering educational programs on urban planning, community building, and the lifestyle of commuters in large American cities. The museum purchased additional cars through a second public offering, with an eye on using them as operational equipment for special events at a later date. A total of 10 cars were purchased at a price competitive with their scrap value. The 10 cars, some of which were still in service at the time, were hand-picked by museum staff. Officials with Metra, along with their mechanical forces, were very accommodating during the selection process and their delivery. We made many good friends at Metra and gathered a great appreciation for the history of the Highliners and the maintenance programs that kept them going for so long. The 18th Street shops in Chicago were home to all 166 cars, 
providing inspections, running repairs, and cleaning. The facility stems from the early Illinois Central days of electrification. Many of the shop personnel in these images had been with the Highliner fleet their entire careers. There is no doubt much history to these 10 cars. One in particular, number 1650, saw the birth of a baby. The child is still a daily passenger on the line. By January 2016, all of the cars selected were out of service and ready for movement to their new life in Texas. Members of the museum staff traveled to Chicago to formally accept the cars and meet with Metra officials who graciously gave us a tour of their general offices and mechanical facilities. Mechanical forces discussed maintenance and operating systems, including lighting, doors, and air conditioning. They demonstrated coupling and uncoupling of the unique Tomlinson-style transit couplers which, compared to conventional knuckle-type couplers, took some getting used to. In late January, the 10 Highliners were rounded up from various storage tracks and assembled into one train. Interestingly, the Metra Electric fleet had always been oriented in the same direction over the years, with the cars ending in even numbers facing north and those ending in odd numbers facing south. The Texas-bound train was inspected and approved for movement by BNSF Railway. BNSF graciously stepped up to the task of transporting the cars, totaling 850 feet in length, the 900 miles to Frisco. They arrived at the museum on February 10th without incident, having made the trip with no mechanical issues thanks to Metra's preparations in Chicago. Two days later, on February 12, 2016, the last train of Highliners made its final run in Chicago, carrying dignitaries and a special banner, thus ending nearly 45 years of faithful service. There was a quiet wake among many loyal riders and Metra employees on that day, as they bid farewell to a significant part of their daily lives. Ten Highliners out of the 166 car fleet escaped the Scrapper's Torch to begin a new role at the Museum of the American Railroad in Frisco, Texas. Each car had traveled over 1.4 million miles and accommodated 3.2 million passengers in just the 28 years of Metro ownership. Yes, their role in history ensured them a place in a museum, but they still had much to offer from a practical standpoint as well. With very little outfitting, some of the new arrivals debuted as classrooms by the beginning of the 2017-2018 academic year. The cars are remarkably complete, with fully functional air conditioning. The 10 Highliners were maintained right up to the date of their retirement, with some having ticket stubs from the last day of service. Branded the Streamliner, an acronym for science, technology, railroading, engineering, arts, and mathematics, the Highliners are a centerpiece of the museum's educational programming and outreach. With two seating areas and center entry, each car can accommodate two classes with room to spare. Now in their third year as immersion experience classrooms, the Highliners have seen thousands of students from Frisco ISD and surrounding school districts. With a concentration on third grade and sixth grade curriculum, the cars are a favorite among students and teachers. We look forward to many more years of student experiences aboard the cars. The basic shell of the Highliners has stood the test of time. Given that they were constructed of carbon steel and of a unibody design, 40 years has treated them quite well. 
the only visible deterioration is along certain portions of the lower side sill, which reflects decades of exposure to salt used to de-ice the boarding platforms at the 49 stations, a mostly cosmetic issue which is quite easily repaired. The future for the cars at the museum is bright. At least two cars will be repainted back to the original 1972 Illinois Central scheme, when time and funding permit. We will of course maintain the current blue and silver scheme on most cars as a tribute to the many people at Metra who operated and maintained them. We are indebted to Metra for helping us preserve the cars and their hospitality during the selection process. Along with the cars came many spare parts for repairs and maintenance. Now if we just had 1500 volts of overhead wire to operate them. One Highliner is reserved for the museum's popular walking tours. And while most visitors encounter the car for the first time, we've had many former Chicagoans get emotional about seeing a little slice of home in Frisco. All that's missing is the take-home box of Gino's East Pizza. There you have it. Everything you wanted to know about the Metra Bi-Level commuter cars at the Museum of the American Railroad. They have touched millions of lives and undoubtedly shaped the way people lived, worked, and played in Chicago. It's stories like these that bring our collection to life and makes their preservation so worthwhile. So the next time you drive by the museum or tour the trains, we hope you have a new appreciation for that long line of blue and silver cars. We'd like to thank our good friends at Metra in Chicago for making the cars available and for providing a wealth of information about them. Our special thanks to the Metra Electric Division and the folks at the 18th Street Repair and Inspection Shop and KYD. Thanks also to BNSF Railway for their continued support of the museum. They swiftly and safely moved the 850 foot long train of Metra cars from Chicago to Texas without a hitch. We hope that you enjoyed this presentation and please don't hesitate to give us your feedback. Look for more outreach presentations about our collection and the fascinating history behind it. See you next time.